The peace of Christ be with you all. Beloved church, happy Sunday. Welcome to worship, those of you who are here in person and you who are joining us online this morning or later in the week. We are delighted to be gathered here on a sunny autumn morning. My name is the Reverend Sarah Schmidt Lee, and I will be sharing leadership of worship this morning with the Reverend Jeremy Simpson, member of our preaching team who is returning, and with our liturgist, Tom Powell, and as you have already seen, with a joint choir composed of our church and the First United Methodist Church's choirs. Welcome. The COVID transmission level for our county is down to low, and that means that wearing a mask is optional, except when we're singing. If when we're singing, if you are participating in singing, we ask that you do put a mask on at that time, because singing is still one of the riskier transmission activities. I believe that those are all of the things that you need to know before worship this morning. We are still in our stewardship season. You'll be hearing a little bit more about that later, but I will call your attention to posters in the front and back that are tracking both the number of pledges we've received and the dollars that those amount to. Thank you to everyone who has made their pledge already. You can continue to make those pledges all the way through these coming months. This church, the first United, or first <laughs> congregational church, <laughs> in Kalamazoo is a member church in the United Church of Christ, where we reaffirm each time that we gather that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Greetings and good morning to everybody. My name's Tom Powell. I'm the church treasurer. Third Sunday of stewardship, good place for me to be. Will you please stand and join me, stand if you're able, and join me in the call to worship? Our God created the world and all that is in it, the earth and all its creatures. How good and lovely it is to live together in unity. Love and faith come together. Justice and peace join hands. Even if Christ's disciples were to keep silent, the very stones would shout aloud, Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall proclaim your praise.
God is here with us in this place and at this time. Let us join our voices together in the opening prayer, which we'll find in our bulletin. Generous God, you have given us gifts beyond counting. You gave us our voices, no two the same, no finer instruments with which to praise you. You gave us words and music, peculiar gifts, with which to wound or wonder, bore or bless, inspire or disable. And in your church, you have gathered us, in your community of common folk and complainers, prophets and puzzled people. You have made a place for us. For this and so much more, we thank you. May all we say and do here all we ponder and decide here, all we receive and give here, be real for us and true to you, and prepare us to live in thanks and praise. Amen. may be seated, and I will invite forward any kids who would like to participate in this morning's blessing. Good morning. We can sit down here today. Good morning, folks. That's a super wiggly walk. I like it. Okay, so... I have a question. What do you do when you pray? What do you do with your body when you pray? Okay, I see Ian has hands folded and Philip. Anybody else do something different? I see Cora's hands folded in her lap. Did you know that sometimes in other traditions, both Christians and people of other religions do different things with their bodies when they pray? Have you seen, yep, some people fold their fingers together. Some people lift their hands up, right? Some people bow their whole bodies forward, right? There's a monastery that my husband goes to that's Episcopalian, and when the monks are praying, they keep bowing at different places in the prayer. That's not something that we usually do in this church. But there are lots of different things we can do with our bodies. What are some of the words you use when you pray? Cora. Amen, Amen is the end of the prayer, right? Do you know that amen is a word from a different language than English? Did you know that? Yeah. Do you know what it... It's one that's fine. Actually, yeah. So do you know what it means uh, in the other language? It, it means the exact same thing as... Okay, so, yeah, it means the same thing in that language. In the original language that had amen, which is Hebrew, it was amen... And it meant, let it be so. So it's like a word of agreement. We've said a whole prayer, and then we're like, yes, we want it to be that way. Let it, let it happen that way. Right? What are some other words that we sometimes use in prayers? Yeah, Philip. Yeah. Mackenzie, are there any prayers that you use, words that you use in prayers at your home? Amen. That's a good one. Well, today we're going to hear some scripture about praying. Starting it. starting it. What are some words that you use to start your prayers? Cora. Uh, Dear God. Right. That's who we're talking to when we pray, right? We're talking to God. So I want you, while you're listening to the scripture today, to think about how you pray, but also to think about why we pray. Do we pray because it's something that we have a habit of doing at certain times every day? Or do we pray when there's something that we really, really want 
and we hope God will make it happen. Sometimes people pray when they're really scared, right? And they need God to come and help. Yeah. And sometimes we pray for other people, right? If there are people dealing with problems that are too big for us to provide all the help they need, sometimes we pray then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we can think about that too, the why we pray. Are you ready for this morning's blessing? Yeah. All right, when we do blessings, we raise a hand, and everybody out there is going to raise their hands too because we're going to send a blessing to them, and they're going to send the blessing back to us. All right? Dear God, thank you that we can talk to you. Help us to know that you love us and you always care about us. Amen. Thanks, guys. is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verses 1 through 8, the parable of the corrupt judge. And I'll be reading from the inclusive Bible, and the wording here may be just a little different from the translation in your pew Bibles. Jesus told the disciples a parable on the necessity of praying always and not losing heart. Once there was a judge in a certain city who feared no one, not even God. A woman in that city who had been widowed kept coming to the judge and saying, give me legal protection from my opponent. For a time, the judge refused. But finally, the judge thought, I care little for God or for people, but this woman won't leave me alone. I'd better give her the protection she seeks, or she'll keep coming and wear me out. Jesus said, listen to what this corrupt judge is saying. Won't God then do justice to the chosen who call out day and night? Will God delay long over them? I tell you, God will give them swift justice. But when the promised one comes, will faith be found anywhere on earth? Hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church. Thanks be to God.
I don't know how you preach after that. I just kind of want to get on the organ now. <laughs> there you go. Thanks, Corey. Thank you, choir. Thank you for the gift of music, Cindy and Corey, for what you bring. Can we offer praise to God for them again this morning? <laughs> Amen. And would you pray with me, please? How good it is to give thanks to you, the one who woke us up this morning, the one who gave us the ability of our activities and limbs, the one who put in our spirit to come be a part of this gathering of people, those who have been called and sent. We honor you this morning. We honor your spirit. And so today, Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this place. We know that you are here. Speak to us now. Amen. Amen. The lesson this morning gives us a picture that's really interesting. And I would say that posture is everything. One of the things that I've learned as a musician that <laughs> makes me think back to my early years studying piano and pipe organ. And my instructors would say, your posture is everything. It takes me back to being a kid and my grandmother would make me stack textbooks on top, on top of my head because she knew that I was tall and I couldn't lean over like this walking, but I had to stand up straight. Posture is everything. It takes me back to a conversation with my grandfather who told me, if you ever get pulled over by the police, make sure that you put your hands like this on the wheel and make sure that you're looking straight forward and make sure you don't say anything accept the answers to their questions because you don't know if your life might be taken. Posture is everything. It takes me back to remembering the words of Reverend Dr. John Perkins, the founder of the CCDA. And he said, God has always wanted the vulnerable in society to be cared for. Posture is everything. And as we look at this story this morning, this story of the persistent widow, I think there's a question that comes from what we've heard. And the question that I felt in my spirit as I was reading this text again over and over and over was this, how bad do you want it? See, the posture that we present shows to those around us what it is that we'll receive but also what it is that we'll give. In the same way as it works with prayer, our posture shows God what it is that we're willing to receive, but even more so, what will we give? Because I know that when I pray, I don't like to pray with my hands clenched in a fist. I like to pray with my hands open to God, open to the spirit that is always blowing, open to the spirit that is always moving. And like this persistent widow, I can resonate with persistent prayer. See, prayer is not only what we offer to God in word, but prayer is offered to God in how we live. It's offered to God in the actions that we make. It's offered to God in our response in praise and adoration for all of who God is. And in this story, Jesus is showing us this conundrum, if you will. He's showing us this dichotomy of thought around persistence, the power of persistence, the power of Posture. Posture is everything. If your posture is lazy, it says that you might not be so interested in a response from what you're looking for. If your posture is upright, it says I'm attentive to what's happening. If you're like me, sometimes your posture slumps over in sleep in a meeting where you're pretending like you're not. <laughs> it doesn't happen all that often because I'm in meetings with some of you guys, so don't ever, <laughs> don't ever look that way. There was once a judge in some city who never gave God a thought. And in addition to not thinking about God, that judge cared nothing for people, posture. A widow in that city kept after him, persistence. My rights are being violated, protect me. When I was reading this passage and becoming renewed 
and transformed by the words of life. My soul rang out, resoundingly so, because I have felt time and time again this same feeling that she expressed. I know what it is to be unjustly treated by a judge, not in a courtroom because I've never gone to court, but by my wife's grandfather. He was a judge. And when we started dating, he asked her questions like, how many times has he been in jail? How many kids does he have? Does he have any education? You know, when those types of people come into our spaces, the property values go down. See, I know what it is to be judged and treated unfa unfairly. I know what it is to be a part of a marginalized community that looks for hope, that looks for resolve. I know what it is to continue in persistence, like the persistence of my ancestors who cried out and said, how long, Lord? How long will we struggle? How long before freedom comes? I'm going to keep on walking, keep on talking, marching up to freedom's land. How long? Persistence. Persistent posture produces something on the inside of us. When my son was a baby, he's going to turn eight years old in January. It's amazing how time flies by. I remember when Erica would be rocking him and he would be cooing, and there was a certain noise that he would make when he was hungry. When he was ready for milk, there was a sound that was different than the cute cry. The parents in the room said amen, right? It wasn't just the but the cry grew in volume. It grew in weight. It grew in tenor. And the strength of that cry began to resound throughout the house. Such is the same of this woman. Such is the same of this widow. Isn't she a representation of the voice of the marginalized? Isn't she a representation of the posture that we should all have in prayer? In fact, the story tells us that this judge never gave her the time of day. But after this went on for quite some time, after she persisted, he even responded and said, I care nothing of what God thinks and even less of what people think. I can resonate with that too. I'm an Enneagram 8 wing 7. <laughs> I would say I'm a recovering Enneagram 8 wing 7, but I don't want to say I'm in recovery. I want to say I'm in full embracing mode. <laughs> and what I'm learning on this journey is that sometimes people will think that I don't care at all about what they think. And that couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, I care very much about what people think. Not to the point that I allow it to dictate and rule my life, but in a place where I consider others. Isn't that something that we're taught to do? To walk justly, to love mercy, to act kindly? Isn't this what God calls us to do? And I believe that our posture in doing so produces much fruit. What kind of fruit does it produce? Well, I believe that prayer is needed to continue in action. For the church to be active and alive, we must pray. For the church to be active and alive, we must persist in crying out to God on behalf of those who are marginalized. We must persist in crying out to God that the amen would resound over and over again, that our agreement would be loud and clear. We stand with you. We stand with you as brothers and sisters and family in the kingdom of God. You know what I'm getting ready to say. The multiracial multilingual, diverse, inclusive family of God. Our posture is everything. The scripture tells us to ask, to seek, and to knock. But at times it seems that our asking and our seeking and our knocking doesn't produce the results that we seek. How do we continue and carry on in a genuine expression of prayer? How do we do this when we don't see the results? How do you continue in the work of diversity and inclusion and equity among you when it seems that systems have been put in place 
to hold you down? How do you continue forward as a six foot five black male with size 16 shoe in ministry among people of different races and ethnicities and sexual identities and margins? How do you do this? How do you unite? How do you call forth the kingdom among us to look more like a kingdom? You see, I believe that prayer fuels us. And I believe that this woman, this widow in this story was fueled. Her persistence was a passion. It was like a fire, similar to those that were waiting in the upper room for the pouring out of the Spirit. They were waiting. They were crying out in loud voices and persisting in prayer. And then Jesus said to them as he was telling the story, do you hear what the judge, corrupt as he is, is saying? How can we think that God won't step in and work justice? The old saints used to say, he may not come when you want him, but he'll be there right on time. You know what I'm talking about, Cindy. How do we do this? Genuine expression of prayer gives us the posture to carry on, to know that hope will not disappoint us, to know that prayer increases our level of thanksgiving and gives us the opportunity to raise our voices in praise and to say, God, even though it doesn't look like what I've been praying for and asking for, I'm going to trust you. It helps us to stir up on the inside the coals and the embers that might be starting to die. And it gives us a passion to say, in the midst of my trust, I don't know what your answer or what your response will be. I don't know how you're going to move in this situation. But like I've read and like I've heard and like I have seen, you show me over and over and over again that every mountain that seems too big is just an opportunity to trust in faith, to keep knocking, to keep seeking, to keep asking, to keep praying, to keep singing, to keep moving, to keep organizing, to keep acting, to keep empowering, to keep listening. You see, there was this exchange that happened between the widow and the judge. The widow is crying out. The widow is seeking. The widow is saying, I am not being treated fairly. What are you going to do about it? And I'm sure that the judge wasn't as described in the passage. He clearly said, I don't care about people and I really don't care about what God thinks. But God cares. God cares about people. God cares about our thoughts. God cares about our emotions. God cares about us. God cares for you. Maybe you're sitting in this beautiful sanctuary this morning. And you've been walking a hard road. Maybe you're sitting in that pew and you're thinking, I hear you, sir, but I haven't seen the results. I've been knocking for years. My family's been knocking for generations. I was telling that story a little earlier about my son, Jaden, who will be eight years old in January. When my partner, Erica, and I started dating 16 years ago, like our second or third date, we picked our kids' names. Shh, that's weird, I know. <laughs> and when we selected the name Jaden, we didn't really know why until we started to research what his name meant. His name means Jehovah has seen and heard. Well, some eight years later, when we were ready to start having kids, as we thought, it just wasn't happening. We kept trying and trying and trying. We kept asking, seeking, and knocking. And we started to look at God as kind of this unfair judge. And we thought, you know that we want children. You know that we want our own children. And this is a sensitive topic for a lot of families. 
We couldn't understand why it wasn't happening in the way that we wanted, in the way that we designed. And so I began to say, let's look at other options. There are plenty of kids in the world who need families. And Erica was okay with that, but she said to me, I just have this sense that we need to be persistent. And so we continued to persist and nothing was happening. And I remember one day I was talking to the Lord in prayer and I was expressing my heart to God. And oftentimes my prayers to God look like tears. It's a language that I think is so strong in prayer. And I believe that God responded to my tears of persistence, my persistent cry and our persistent cry in asking him to bless us with children, with this gift that we had longed for. And one day we were in prayer and I felt this peace. I felt the spirit respond. And as I felt that response, what I recognized was God was not judging me unfairly, but God was walking with me in that process to produce more of God's nature in me. See, prayer is not for us to change God's heart. Prayer changes us. That widow persisted because as she was knocking on the door of this judge, it was changing her resolve. It was giving her the fortitude to keep on walking, to keep on talking, to keep on nudging. We all judge things unfairly. In fact, if you're human, you at one point or another in your life will find yourself unjustly judging. But what happened in my life as I was unjustly judging God, I was reminded of my state. Who am I? Who am I to judge this loving creator? Who am I to judge the one that gives me life? And we know that this judge was not offering this widow life. This judge was not offering her the chance to survive a situation. But this judge represents our thoughts. I often say in order for us to believe in prayer, we have to look past the middle of that word. Why? B-E-L-I-E-V-E. We must look past the lies that are in front of us to continue to persist in prayer. In fact, the widow in this parable functions as a model for discipleship. She functions as a model for what it looks like for us to have an example of persistent prayer. In fact, I would say that she represents a midwife, if you will, someone that works in the middle of the birthing process to see it through. Posture is everything. And I believe that the cry of our posture says to the Lord how bad we want something. Because we're spoiled, each one of us in this room, because we tend to think that it has to be our way or no way, we give up so easily, don't we? We knock for a little bit and then our knuckles start to hurt. We ask for a little bit and then our voices start to get weary and tired. Or maybe we work and move toward what it is that we think God's calling us in resolving injustice. But perhaps the Spirit is calling us to persist a little more. Perhaps the Spirit is inviting us to partner with God. Perhaps, like this widow, as she was resilient, she was faithful in the midst of injustice, in the midst of being treated unfairly, in the midst of having no power at all to change anything, she spoke with a voice to powerful systems and said, you will listen to me. She recognized that it was not in her own strength. Sorry, my Pentecostal roots come out sometimes. She recognized it was not in her own strength. It was not in her own power, but it was by the Spirit of God that was inside of her, giving her the strength to stand before unjust systems and say, I will not be quiet. I will not be silent. I will not shut up. You will listen to what I have to say because I am a daughter of the Most High God. We are children 
of the King of Kings. Is that Fritz Kryhoff in the back right there? Hey, Pastor. We are children of the Most High God. And in the midst of our crying out, in the midst of our persistence, God shows up with the wind that we cannot see. God shows up with the wind that moves things out of the way. Because guess what? God doesn't care about obstacles. Obstacles are nothing to God. And so the widow continued in faithful resolve. Let the amen sound from God's people again. Let the amen, amen in prayer is equal to agreement. When we say amen, we are agreeing with what God has already done. When we say amen, we are saying, God, we agree to equality. God, we agree to discipling out racism. God, we agree to discipling in your kingdom. God, we agree to destructing and tearing down walls that have divided us. God, we agree to seeing equality among us. This widow, and even more so the judge, is teaching us something important here. It's teaching us to express in hard spaces, in systems that cause oppression. It's teaching us not to focus on the oppressor, but to focus on the one who breaks oppression, to focus on the one who grants liberty. My family, my ancestors, my great-grandparents were born slaves, some in Stearns, Kentucky, and some down in Alabama. They moved to the North in the 1940s to Chicago, where the racism wasn't as bad. And then they came over to West Michigan, of all places to the grand Dutch town of Holland, Michigan. <laughs> in a space where they tell you, if you ain't Dutch, you ain't much. I heard you mumble it, I heard you. <laughs> the German and, and other brothers and sisters in the room said, we know. And in a space, in a community that was so full of religion, some of those same folks would burn crosses in their yard on the north side of Holland. Imagine that. Some of those same folks would see them in a park and say racial slurs to them. And they would address my grandmother and say, get those inward kids out of here. But you know what I've learned through those stories? What I've learned through those moments is that all of those were pieces of prayer. The crying out and the injustice. The crying out and the injustice. The balance of faith being spelled risk and realizing that that risk could cause my life to be taken. But let the amen sound from God's people again. May we say amen, amen. until we are all lost in wonder, love, and praise. How bad do you want it? Amen. Thank you so much, Jeremy. You talked about your prayer language being tears, I've learned over the years that mine is bratty complaining. But those are the moments when I experience God's compassion and love most deeply and find myself transformed. So it's worth it to get to that place of authenticity with God. In this stewardship season, we are trying to look holistically at all the ways we give of ourselves to God and in response to God's love in and through this community. 
So we had a couple of weeks talking about our financial pledging. If you've not yet made your financial pledge, you still have the opportunity to do that. There are physical cards at the welcome desk. There are ways to log in online and make that pledge online in a confidential way. But starting this week, we want to look at some of the other areas of our life together in which we are called to invest. And today, you'll see a card in your bulletin that says, investing together in our relationships. And then there are places where you can choose to participate in the ministry teams of our church. Now, what is the connection? Like, why are we talking about ministry teams in the context of relationship? Well, in some churches, building relationships and doing ministry are separated into different categories, and you join certain groups to form relationships, and you join other groups to, like, do things together. But in this church, we've recognized that most of our members come here because other people in this church do things that they care about. It's the doing together that binds us together as a community. And so we try to focus on the ministry teams and the work we do together as the context in which relationships are formed. We also recognize that ministry teams are way bigger than meetings, business meetings that happen monthly or quarterly. Ministry teams are all of the work of these different groups. So if you're in the choir, you're part of the worship arts team. If you have volunteered in the nursery or your children come to faith formation, you are part of the faith formation team. If you've served as an usher, you are part of the parish care team. If you are going to go help with the winterization project at the end of this month, that is participating in the mission and social justice team. So being a part of a ministry team is about doing work together with other people who are passionate about the same things and being able to use your skills and your passions in a way that are meaningful and contribute to the work that we can only do together. There is so much that we can do together that none of us would be able to do alone. So you'll see on this card that on the left-hand side, you can express your intent to participate in a new ministry team. If you are already invested in ministry teams, many people are involved in more than one, you can use the far right column to let us know I'm already plugged into these ministry teams. And if you want to learn more about specific ministry teams before you commit to one, that's what the center column is for. And when you check those boxes, you will hear back from leaders of the ministry team that you've checked um, to give you more information about that. We also are having a ministry team panel discussion after worship next Sunday. So immediately following worship, you can move into the atrium, and there will be representatives from each of these ministry teams who will be there to talk about what their ministry team does and what some of the easiest places are to plug in. So if you want to wait until you've had a chance to participate in that before you fill out your card, you can do that as well. But when you fill out this card and put it in the offering basket or one of the baskets at the front or back of the church, then we will track, not with your name, but just by numbers. We'll have a poster similar to the financial pledge one, but with each of the ministry teams, and we'll have a tally so that we can see how many people are involved or hoping to become involved in each of the ministry teams. And this is important because we want balance. We want to see where more help is needed, where we can balance things in the life of our church together. So please take a moment today or over this week to fill this out and return it in your offering. At this time, I will invite our ushers forward to receive this morning's offering.
have come into the house of the Lord to praise his holy name, to give honor, glory, and adore his son whose life he gave. Let the trumpet sound, let the rocks resound, our sinful souls he saved.
loving God, we give you thanks for every gift you have given us. And this morning, we return all of our gifts, our gifts of praise and adoration, our gifts of dedication, our financial gifts and the gifts of ourselves. We give them all to you because we know that it is through you that we can participate in the healing of our community and in justice for this world. Amen. You may be seated. In our prayers this morning, we will continue to participate in the Southwest Association Prayer Project, in which each week we pray for a different community or a different category of pastors in the Southwest Association of the UCC. And a happy happenstance is that this week, the authorized clergy that we are praying for include the Reverend Julie Klein, who is the pastor at First United Methodist Church. Please join me in prayer. God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for your presence with us. For your presence with us when we genuinely don't feel it and have a hard time believing. And your presence with us in those moments when all of the facade falls and we come before you with our rawest selves and experience your love. We pray this morning for our world. We pray for those who are crying out against injustice. This morning, we particularly remember women and girls in Iran, families in the Ukraine, and in Russia who are torn apart because of war. And families in our own nation and our own communities who have experienced the impact of gun violence. We pray that you would give us the urgency participate in these cries for justice, to recognize that these injustices impact us, impact all of humanity. Give us courage and vision to be your disciples. We pray for those who are hurting loved ones who are recovering from surgery or illness, those who are grieving. May we have the opportunity to share your love, to be a part of the community of peace. We pray for the Reverend Tracy Heilman and the Reverend Julie Klein. We pray for our designated pastor search team. We hold these prayers before you, God, along with those that we carry silently, knowing that you hear even the prayers that we don't have words for. and that we are your beloved. And it is with confidence, as those who are called children of God, that we pray together that prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our mother, Father God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
Good morning, beloved congregation. Isn't this a glorious morning in this space and with all of this music too? It just feels like a wave of love to me. And I'm so thankful for our First, congregation, first Congregational Church Choir and also the First United Methodist Church kinfolk that are with us here today. What a blessing. What a blessing. By the way, I'm the moderator of the church right now, so whatever. Um, FCC informational meetings, interested in membership or just interested in learning more about FCC, there's no commitment or anything. They're going to meet upstairs, Mary and Martha room, after worship with Diane and Sarah to go over those different things. A Northside Winterization Project. This is a way for us to love our community and love our community where they're struggling, quite honestly. So that's taking place Friday, October 28th at 8.30 a.m., um, AME Chapel, all the other details are in there. If uh, Sign up on your connection card, please. Party, party. Who likes to party in this church? Come on! <laughs> okay, okay, great, 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 great. Party in the parking lot, October 30th. This is kind of a harvest Halloween party, and we're going to even have a highly talented barista there, Isaac James. <laughs> he's <laughs> he's going to have some amazing different treats that day for those. Let's see, what else? Uh, meeting Correction, Mission, and Social Justice, Sunday, October 30th, rather than the 23rd. We have Friendship Hour. It's back in the atrium area after worship with coffee and goodies. Uh, safe Conduct Training. This is part of our safe church policy. We have to be very intentional on people who are working with vulnerable populations in our church, and this is part of that training. It will take place on Tuesday. If you have any questions, let Sarah know. Um, Isaac Virtual Public Meeting, which is on the 23rd at First United Methodist Church, or they have a Zoom option. Make sure to engage in that. That's been a long-time commitment of FCC to engage in that, again, loving and caring and advocating for our community. Uh, welcome team volunteers. You know, things are opening up. Things are changing back, loosening up, and we need people to watch the door. This is one of our things that we believe highly in. This building doesn't belong to us really. It belongs to our wider community, and it's a meeting place for groups in our community as well. So, and those welcome team volunteers make that happen. Again, there's going to be training in that on October 29th, 9 a.m. to noon here at church. KDCCC is looking for a lunch volunteer. That's the, the daycare down in our basement area. So, if you're interested in being a volunteer for that, again, sign up on your connection card or let the office know. Non-perishable food offerings um, are welcome every week. Every week, bring something from your pantry down to church. And these offerings brought by adults will be given to children to bring forward during the doxology. All food offerings will be donated to loaves and fishes. And oh my goodness, I think I got everything today. So, so let us continue in the bulletin together. Affirmation of our church. As members of Christ's body and of one another, unique parts of a beloved whole, we give thanks for this gathering and for the one who gathers us. In our scattering, may we remain together in spirit, reflecting God's love in all we do. Amen. Our closing hymn is Here I Am, Lord, number 525.
people of God, holy and dearly loved, go from this place knowing that our God is just and faithful and true. Go building and inviting and creating space for the multiracial, multilingual, inclusive body and family of God to have a place, knowing that God is with us. Amen.